these critical last days, many parents are concerned about the peer pressure that their children face. Parents themselves face peer pressure as well. How can families maintain their steadfastness in the face of such an onslaught? One vital key is making effective family Bible reading, study, and discussion a way of life. When families follow such a program regularly and in a manner that makes the Bible come alive, this Bible-oriented routine can have a tremendous impact on the family. It builds our knowledge. It strengthens our faith. And it provides us with role models, profoundly faithful men and women of ancient times who can inspire us, moving us to stand up for the truth. Let's look in on one family. Observe how the parents draw their children out, involve them in conversation, and tailor the scriptural material to meet their needs. And let's learn along with them from a vivid Bible drama taken from the book of Daniel. Okay, everybody, let's close our Bibles for a moment. Now, please tell me, is everything all right? What do you mean, John? Well, I'm concerned about Chris here and Michelle. What's the matter with you tonight? Oh, I, I'm i fine, Dad. Me too. What do you mean? Y you both seem so quiet. You usually have all kinds of comments and questions during our family Bible study and discussion. Tonight, you've hardly said a thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Your answers have all been correct, and that's really good. But I just feel as if you're not really with us. No. No, I'm listening. I'm just... I... I'm having a hard time concentrating. Okay. But can you tell me why? Is there anything I can do to make our Bible reading more interesting for you? No. No, it's interesting. It just... Just what, Chris? Well, it just seems so long ago. I mean, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even their names sound so... so ancient. It's, it's as if they lived a million years ago. Sometimes I wonder what it all has to do with me today. Is that how you feel too, Michelle? Well, kind of. I know it's important and all. I've heard the story so many times, I feel like I almost know it by heart. The three Hebrews wouldn't bow down to the image no matter what because it was idolatry. And that's the same reason we don't get involved in any idolatry today, too, like flag salutes. But... That's a very good summary. But what? Well, it's kind of like Chris said. It's a little hard to figure out what it means to me today. I don't think I'll ever get involved with any kind of idolatry. So this almost seems like, oh, I don't know, ancient history. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that bad? Michelle, I'm glad to know how you feel. And you too, Chris. We want to know what's on your minds. That's one of the most important things about our family study. And I'm pretty sure we can make our Bible reading take on greater meaning for us. We just need to see how it applies to our own lives today. Let's start with this question. What's the most difficult challenge you've had to face in school lately? No, let me clarify that. Um, I don't mean a challenge like a homework assignment or an unexpected quiz. I mean a challenge to your faith, because you're a witness. Chris, how about you? Challenge. Let me think. Um, being different from the other kids and not going along with all the things they do? Uh, peer pressure? <laughs> Are you asking me or telling me? No, telling. That's it, peer pressure. That's mine too, peer pressure. Okay, so peer pressure has been especially bad lately. What kind of peer pressure? Can you be more specific? Michelle? Mm. Well... How about you, Chris? Um, I don't know. It's all right to talk about it. We all face peer pressure. 
I get it at work all the time, every day just about, in one form or another. And to tell you the truth, I know I don't always deal with it as well as I should. It's not easy. And Wanda, you get it too, don't you? Sure. Just the other day I was at the market, and three women from the neighborhood came up to me and asked me to help organize a big neighborhood Christmas event. And they really caught me off guard. I told them I couldn't, but I don't think I explain myself well. I'm still thinking about what I could have said to handle the situation better. I guess I don't usually think about you two facing peer pressure. Now, what about you, Michelle? What kind of peer pressure have you had to deal with lately? Well, there was this conversation at school. Some kids were talking about this movie that one girl had seen. She said it was really bad. Adults only. Her parents had rented it and hidden it. But she went sneaking into the living room at night and watched it. And she told you all of this? Well, she was telling these other kids. I was standing in line with them waiting for our school bus. But then she stopped talking and looked at me and said I wasn't supposed to hear about that kind of stuff. Because... Because of what, Michelle? She said it was because I'm in some weird religion that says I have to be boring. Well, that was a mean thing to say. It didn't really bother me. Good. I wouldn't blame you if it did, though. Nobody likes to be called boring. But let me tell you something. They don't know you. I've known you for 14 years, and you've never bored me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. But tell me this. What did you feel like doing when she said that? Yeah, did you feel like telling her off? Chris? Oh, Chris, stop it. No, but I did feel like saying I could hear whatever I want that I'm not boring, and then just dare her to tell me anything she wanted. But what did you do? I just walked away and went to the end of the line. Good girl. And now, looking back, is there anything you'd like to have done differently? Well, I wish I would have walked away earlier, right when the conversation started heading the wrong way. I guess I really wanted to fit in with them. And I wish I could have said something to make them stop and think. Thanks for being so open about it, Michelle. That was a tough case of peer pressure. But now, what about you, Chris? What kind of peer pressure have I faced? That's it. Well, it's kind of embarrassing. See, I didn't really handle it well. <laughs> I guess I haven't handled it at all, yet. That's okay, son. Maybe that's a good reason to talk about it now. All right. It was just today. There are these two girls in my class. They seem really nice in a way, and smart. They're in a couple of my classes, and they get good grades. Are they cute, Chris? Oh, uh, I guess so. Not that I've really noticed. <laughs> so, what about them? Well, they were all excited about this party, or... Sort of a get-together they're having this Friday, so, um... So they invited you? Who are these girls? Do I know Michelle, them? Michelle, let Chris tell the story. And yes, they invited me. And they made a big point of saying that I never do anything with the other kids after class. That I act as if they all have the plague or something. Well, I don't blame them for wanting to have you around. You're the pick of the class as far as I'm concerned. Oh, Mom. No, I mean it. How many decent, honest young men like you do you think they can find these days? And handsome, too. Mom. But girls today amaze me. They're so forward. Did they tell you anything else about this party? Yes. They said it would be a lot of fun because one of the girls is having it in her house, and her parents will be away. And how did that sound to you? To be honest... I guess a part of me thought it sounded like fun, but at the same time, I knew it sounded like trouble. That's good, Chris. That shows your discernment. So, how did you answer them? Well, that's kind of the bad part. I didn't really answer them. At first I did. I told them I was busy Friday, but then they played up that whole idea that I act as though they have a disease. And I felt sort of bad about it, so I told them it wasn't that at all. Anyway, they wouldn't listen. They told me to think about it and let them know in a day or two. Hmm. Persistent girls. And what did you say to that? Nothing, really. I said I'd let them know. And so I've been racking my brain ever since, 
trying to figure out how to say no. Do you think that may be one reason why it's so hard to concentrate tonight? Yes, I guess so. Well, son, I'm glad you didn't agree to go to that party. But part of you wanted to, right? Maybe. Yes. And it sounds as though there were a couple of things you wish you had handled differently. Is that right? Yes, definitely. I wish I hadn't told them I'd think about it. Doing that only delayed the problem and made it worse. And I wish I could have said something that made sense to them, or at least let them know where I stand. I'm glad to hear that, son. And those are all good goals for the next time. Goals your mom and I know you can reach. Same with you, Michelle. And you know something? The more we talk about this, the more I realize that we have something that will help you. Right here, staring us in the face. What do you mean, Dad? The Bible? Well, yes. But more specifically, the very material we've been reading over together. This week's Bible reading from Daniel chapter 3. Now, I know you both were having a hard time relating to this material. You were wondering what it has to do with you today, right? Right. Well, let's try it again. But this time, I think we need to put a little more energy into it. I've got some research on this chapter from a talk I once gave. Michelle, let's get out the Insight volumes and the Publications Index, too. I think we've got everything. Now, this time, let's really concentrate and put ourselves in this story. Let's imagine what it felt like to be there. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the land, the people. This research will help us. And as we go, let's keep our eyes open for three basic points. Are you ready? Uh, what points? First, what tool was Satan using on these three young men to get them to stop serving Jehovah? Second, what enabled them to resist? And third, how can we use their example in our own daily lives? Does everyone have those points in mind? Yes. yes. Then let's begin. First of all, let's remember that these three young Hebrew men were captives in Babylon, far from home. Their captors gave them the Babylonian names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But among themselves, they probably kept using their own Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now this all happened about 600 years before the days of Christ. In just a few moments, Hananiah, it will all be over. Are you prepared, Mishael? If it could be otherwise, I would wish it so. But my trust is in our God, Jehovah. It is well, my brother. And you, Azariah? Hananiah, I fear only the true God. The officials of the king are assembling themselves in the plain below. And see, the musicians are stationing themselves all around the golden image. Nebuchadnezzar the king has positioned his tent well. The whole plain of Dura is visible from here. The image in the center, and all the people gathered around. And where should we station ourselves, Hananiah? I, for my part, would be willing to stand right here, in front of the very tent of the king himself. You are too daring, Azariah. I'm not afraid to show my stand for Jehovah. No, nor are we. But Mishael is right, my brother. 
It isn't our wish to antagonize the king. It's only that we cannot bow down and serve the image that he set up. It would seem more discreet if we were to take our position where we would be the least conspicuous. It wouldn't be pleasing to our God to flaunt our disagreement with the king before his very face. We have no desire to interfere with the program he set up for his people. It's true, Mishael. If the king wishes to have his people bow before the image, that's his choice. But the law of our God, Jehovah, will not permit us to bow before any other god, even though we're captives, slaves in the land of Babylon. Has the king returned from his tour of inspection? No, my lord Ashpenaz. It was his wish to see that everything is in order. As for Hananiah and Azariah and me, we were reviewing the assembling of the people from in front of the king's tent. Here. You keep confusing me with your Hebrew names, Meshach. I know you only as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Please forgive me, my lord Ashpenaz. I meant no disrespect. It's only that we still think of ourselves as Hebrews, despite our many years here. I know it well, Meshach. It seems only yesterday that the king brought you from your land across the desert, along with your companion Belteshazzar, the one whom you call Daniel. It seems a much longer time to us, my lord. Yes, I'm sure it does. Much has happened since then, and you have administered the affairs of the king wisely and well. But I must warn you, Shadrach, you have enemies among the officials of the king. Thank you, my lord, but we are aware of it. Some, especially Zatu and Asgad, are extremely jealous and covet your positions and would not hesitate to do you evil. You have been a true friend to us, my lord Ashpenaz, and to the king. We too seek only good for the king. Your loyalty has been proved many times, Meshach, and yours, Shadrach and Abednego. The king trusts you, but I fear for you now. You know our reason for being gathered here on the plain of Dura. Yes, we know what the king has decreed. And the king will expect everyone to comply with his decree. Why, just look at that great image and the gold glistening in the sun. Yes, I understand that it's 60 cubits in height and 6 cubits in breadth. It's big, all right. And you know what the king has decreed for those who do not fall down and worship the image at the sound of the music. That one will at the same moment be thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Will the law of your God indeed allow you to do this thing that the king has commanded? The law of our God is quite clear, my lord Ashpenaz. It says simply, you must not have any other gods against my face. You must not make for yourself a carved image. You must not bow down to them, nor be induced to serve them, because I, Jehovah your God, am a God exacting exclusive devotion. Keeping the dietary law of your God is one thing. But this is a matter of life and death. We are not free to decide which part of God's law we will keep or set aside. I would dissuade you if I could. But I know you would never be turned aside from the law of your God. May your God protect you and watch over you. There you are, you three. We knew that you would be here. And why shouldn't we be, Hashem? The king has commanded all his officials to be present. Do you really intend to refuse to bow before the image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up? Of course we would refuse. Is there any other choice to make? But you know what it will mean. If you refuse to bow before the image, not only will you lose your life, but it will be taken as evidence that none of our people will bow before the image. What right do you have to compromise all of us in this defiance of the king? We do not defy the king, but we cannot keep this law. It asks us to defy the law of the true God. But why can you not perform this act that he's requested? It's just a small thing. Yes, it's just a small thing. A recognition of the king's authority over us. It may seem like a small thing, Hashem, but was it not also a small thing that our God required of Adam and Eve? Ah! So many trees in the garden, yet only the one was withheld. Oh, Shadrach, you're always making... But did the true God view their disobedience as a little thing? Look how his anger has been expressed against Adam. And all of us, his children, since then. We knew that you'd be obstinate in this matter. And so we've come to urge you to reconsider and not 
misrepresent our position before our captors, the Babylonians. You see, it's the word of Jehovah at the hand of his prophet Jeremiah. God has told us we must serve Nebuchadnezzar. How then can you defy the commandment that he's made for us? It's true that our God has given us into the hand of the king of Babylon. But why has he done so? Because the people did not serve Jehovah. But now we are serving Jehovah by keeping his commandment to serve the king of Babylon. Hashem, and you, Baana, we have listened carefully to all that you have had to say. But you are wrong in this matter, and you are confusing the commandments of God. You admit that the reason Jehovah allowed us to become captives to the people of Babylon is because our fathers forsook the commandments of Jehovah and turned away from the true worship. Is this not true? Yes, but... Then let me ask you this. Does Jehovah change? Of course not, but... Are you and Baana saying that Jehovah is now asking us to follow a course he condemned us for before? That he is now asking us to turn aside from true worship? and to bow before the gods of Babylon, when it was this very course of action that caused him to make us captives in this land? You, you... You would make God out to be inconsistent, Hashem, yet God never denies himself. You're twisting the facts with words, Shadrach. Jehovah told us to be at peace with our captors, but you are not at peace, and... and you are going to make all of us appear guilty to the king. Now, my brother, listen. Has our captivity to Babylon not yet taught you that, when necessary, it is better to incur the wrath of men than it is to anger the true God? But it isn't necessary. You're just... As for the king, don't misunderstand. We do pray for peace for this city, and that it may go well with our people. We recognize Nebuchadnezzar's place in God's purpose, as his servant, and we don't oppose that. But when the king goes beyond God's commission for him and actually sets himself in opposition to God, why should we fear him or serve him in this matter? Then you are determined to defy King Nebuchadnezzar's order? We will keep God's law. Then you will make us all pay for your rash decision. Look, look, Hashem. King Nebuchadnezzar is coming with the chief of the bodyguard and two Chaldean officers of the court. As for you men... Remember what we have told you. And now, if it please the king, my companions and I would join the other officials of the king and take our place in the plain according to the king's command. It is well, Shadrach. And if it would please the king, Asgad and I would accompany the three Jews, whom you have appointed over the administration of the jurisdictional district of Babylon. You have my permission, Zatu. It is a pleasure to see the zeal of the Jews and their obedience to this command of the king. We will join with them in bowing down before the image at the sound of the music. Will you precede us, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we may follow you? And we will all bow down together. It is well. Ariok, proceed to the musicians and give them the signal that all is ready. To you it is being said, O peoples, national groups, and languages, that at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the triangular harp, the stringed instrument, the bagpipe, and all sorts of musical instruments, you fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will at the same moment be thrown into the burning fiery furnace. King, live on even for times indefinite. May we speak to the king on a most pressing matter? Speak, Zatu and Asgard. 
You yourself, O king, set forth the command that whoever would not fall down and worship the image should be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. I did. Now hear, O king, there exist certain Jews you have appointed over the district of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These able-bodied men have paid no regard to you, O king. What? They are not serving your own gods, and the image of gold that you have set up, they are not worshipping. Arioch, find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and bring them here before me. At once, my lord. You were present with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they did not bow down before the image? We were standing by their side, O king. And when the musical instruments began to play, Asgad and I fell to our knees and bowed down before the golden image, even as you had commanded, O king. But when we looked, O king, why, there were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still standing and not bowing down before the image. We spoke to them indignantly, O king, but still they refused to bow down before the image. Refused to bow? Arrogantly refused, my lord. They reviled the gods of Babylon. And spoke all manner of evil against the king. Against the king? When the musicians had finished playing on their musical instruments, why, we got up from our knees and hurried here in order that we might report the matter to you, O king. I see. You have been most generous, O king, in exalting these men to a high position in the kingdom, although they are themselves only slaves. And it is you yourself, O king, who have ordered that whoever does not fall down and worship will at the same moment be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. I will make an example of these three. If this thing becomes known to the Jews, and yet nothing is done, then all the Jews will refuse to bow down to the golden image, and the kingdom will be divided. The king is wise. The kingdom must be united. It is with justice that you are acting to punish these men, captives of Babylon who have, with a high hand, defied the very orders of the king. Is it really so, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you are not serving my own gods, and the image of gold that I have set up you are not worshipping? O king, live on even for times indefinite. It is true that we have not bowed down before the image of gold. The god whom we serve is a jealous god, and has commanded that we bow before no other god. It is even as we reported it, O king. Look, O king, they would defy you to your very face. Your god is the god of Belteshazzar, your Daniel. He is the god of gods and a revealer of secrets. But he could not deliver the Jews from the hands of the king of Babylon. Even your own prophets, speaking in his name, commanded you to be subject to the king of Babylon. May the king live for times indefinite. The king is well informed as to our prophets. But these spokesmen for our God also informed us that our God was angry with us because we had worshipped other gods instead of him. I do not ask you to stop serving your God. I ask you only to serve also the gods of Babylon and to bow down to the image I have set up. All the officials of the kingdom are here, those who are Chaldeans and those from other nations whom I have conquered. I would have all the people worship as one. The gods of Babylon have proved themselves stronger than the gods of the nations. I will have all the people who are subject to Babylon bow to Babylon's gods. The king speaks with the wisdom of the gods. Only in this way will we ensure the loyalty of the people. And maintain the strength of Babylon. Do you realize you are slaves in the land of Babylon, a captive people? You owe your lives to Babylon, yet in my generosity I have honored you, fed you from my own table, exalted you to a position of trust, made you administrators of the district of Babylon. And this is the way they repay you, O king. We do not defy the king, nor are we disloyal to you, O king. 
we obey the king's law and we administer it honestly. Only as regards the law of our God, we must not compromise. See how they continue to defy the king? Would you try the patience of the king to the limit? See how long he has tolerated your insolence and your defiance. The king's word has gone out to all the people. My order must stand. Now, if you are ready so that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the triangular harp, the string instrument, and the bagpipe, and all sorts of musical instruments, you fall down and worship the image that I have made, all right. But if you do not worship, at that same moment you will be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that god that can rescue you out of my hands? O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are under no necessity in this regard to say back a word to you. If it is to be, our god whom we are serving is able to rescue us. Out of the burning, fiery furnace, and out of your hand, O oh king, he will rescue us. And if not, let it become known to you, O king, that your gods are not the ones we are serving, and the image of gold that you have set up we will not worship. Then you will be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, and we will see if your god can deliver you out of my hand. Zatu, heat up the furnace seven times more than it is customary to heat it up. Ariok, have these men bound in their mantles, their garments, and their caps, and their other clothing, and throw them into the burning, fiery furnace. Ariok, stand before me and explain what this marvel is that you thought I should see with my own eyes. O oh, king, live on even for times indefinite. The command that you have given ha has been carried out, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been thrown into the burning fiery furnace. But because the king's word was so urgent, and the heat from the furnace was so fierce, the able-bodied men who were carrying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were burned to death by the flames from the fire. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell still bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. But then, ah... Uh... Was it not three able-bodied men that we threw bound into the midst of the fire? Look, I'm beholding four able-bodied men walking about free in the midst of the fire. And there's no hurt to them. And the appearance of the fourth one is resembling a son of the gods. And look, O oh king, nothing burns. Even their clothing appears unscathed. Only their bonds must have been burned away, for they move about freely. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, step out and come here. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants that trusted in him, and that changed the very word of the king, and gave over their bodies because they would not serve and would not worship any god at all except their own god. Ashpenaz, make note of this and see that it is done. From me and otters being put through, that any people, national group, or language that says anything wrong against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be dismembered, and its house should be turned into a public privy, forasmuch as there does not exist another god that is able to deliver like this one. 
thought about this story like that. It seems so real, I could almost feel the heat from the furnace. Yeah, Dad. You brought out a lot of things I'd never thought about before. Like what it must have felt like for those three to stand up against all of that. Well, that brings us to our review. Remember, we said we'd look out for three basic points. Do you remember what they were? I do. First was uh, something about what tool Satan used to get the three to stop serving Jehovah, right? Good, Michelle. And what was it? Everyone was trying to make them do what they knew was wrong. Good, Michelle. And what do we call that? Peer pressure. Just what we were talking about. Exactly. How heavy do you think that pressure was? Pretty bad. I mean, they probably had some of their own people pressuring them because those Jews wanted to fit in with the Babylonians. Right. And then they definitely had all those crowds of Babylonians, thousands of people, all bowing down to the image and mad at them for not joining in. They sure must have stood out. And then they had to face that fiery furnace. Dad... They didn't really know whether Jehovah would save them, did they? Good point, Michelle. They knew he could. But in any case, they were going to keep their integrity, even in the face of death. And that brings up the second review question. What enabled those three young men to resist all that pressure? Well, I think it was lots of things. Courage, boldness, strength. Love. What did you say, Chris? Um... I said love. I think it really boiled down to how much they loved Jehovah. Nothing could make them compromise. That's excellent, Chris. That's a beautiful answer, son. Michelle, you were right, too. They did need courage and strength. Is that the kind of person you both want to be? Strong and determined to stand up for what you believe in, no matter what people say? Yes. Yes. Good. But getting back to what Chris said, the main thing was, and always is, love. Love of Jehovah God. That's what makes us loyal to him and helps us keep our integrity. Now, who remembers our third review question? I do. It was about our everyday lives. I know. How we can use their example. The three Hebrews, I mean. Good, Michelle. Now... You two don't think of their story simply as ancient history anymore, do you? No, not me. Me neither. They were dealing with the same basic problem we have, and they succeeded. Exactly, Chris. So let's talk a little more specifically about how to imitate their example. Let's get out the Young People Ask book and see what it has to say about peer pressure. I think we'll find some practical ways for both of you to reach your goal of dealing with this problem better in the future. But first, let me just ask you this. How do you think Jehovah felt about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they stood up to all the pressure they faced? He must have been proud of them. That's right, honey. And that's just how your mother and I feel about you two when you stand up to peer pressure. And we know you do a good job of it every day. If there's some need for improvement, fine. We know you can handle it. And we're here to help. More important, Jehovah knows you can do it. You can make Jehovah's heart rejoice, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 